I'm Gary Kloss with Genesis well. Rescue Systems, and thanks for tuning in to the first Live Cut event. This should be an ongoing series of extrication instructional classes designed to hopefully improve your extrication skills. It's important to emphasize that this is not a speed evolution. We're not going to run through this and say, hey, how fast can we do this? This is more a very slow process designed to educate you, our viewers, and hopefully open up a couple of different avenues for your next auto extrication. So as you know, the first part of an extrication always starts when dispatch comes out. We get an idea of what we may have, which is usually a 1050, an MVA, or an MVC, but really not what is involved. That's left for us to unwrap once we get there. So before those tones hit, let's talk about your tools just a little bit. The normal complement of extrication tools for most departments is going to be a spreader, a cutter, a ram, and then if you have one, a ram kit. Hopefully a sawzall, and we're gonna talk about blades in just a little bit, and the manufacturers of the saws all really are somewhat immaterial. But you want to make sure that your tools are ready to go. If you have gasoline power units, make sure the gasoline is fresh. Make sure the hoses are in good condition. Make sure the tools are clean and ready to operate. Which means when you get back from your last extrication and it's rainy or mud or wetty, muddy or wet. Sorry, this is live, so I'm probably going to jack this up a times just so you know. So it goes. You want to make sure they're clean and ready to function, okay? Depending on how you store your tools is going to basically be how they come out of the rig. The second you take your tools out of the holder when you're walking towards the scene, make sure that you close the spreaders up so they're ready to spread, and make sure that you open the cutters up so they're ready to cut. So what other tools are you going to bring with you? Well, depending on your department's complement, it could be a number of different things. You may decide that you want to have an ax or a halligan bar. Definitely a sawzall. Okay, some type of glass cutting tool. So let's talk about blades just a little bit when we're talking about sawzalls. Everybody has their own opinion, and a lot of the opinions expressed on today's event are going to be what I personally like. Now this is not an endorsement of one particular brand over another. This is just what seems to work best in my opinion. You can have your differing opinions, and that's cool. Nobody's trying to change your mind. We're just gonna talk about the different blades for just a little bit. So one of my favorites is a Diablo. 9-inch Diablo blade, 10 teeth per inch carbide. Now there's a bit of a difference between these two blades. One has a rounded edge, one has a little bit more of a streamlined edge. Some people prefer this because it'll get them into crevices a little bit tighter. Some people prefer this. Prefer this. The other blade that I really like is the Torch. Again, 9-inch, 10 TPI. 10 TPI seems to be pretty much the best all around when it comes to metal. If you have the demolition blades or anything like that, they're really not going to do you a whole lot of good on an extrication scene because they're designed to cut me metal and wood, and we want to make sure we're cutting just metal. Some guys like to carry a pruning blade. This is specifically for windshields. Sometimes the windshields will dull these blades out pretty quickly, but this is really, really nice to cut windshields as long as you keep in mind that this blade will throw shards really far away and on a windy day, they'll carry those shards even further. So before you break glass or cut windshields, make sure you let everybody know, make sure the patient is covered, make sure the people inside the vehicle acknowledge the fact that you're going to cut glass, and then go ahead and finish it off. Now, everything we do in the extrication scene is de completely dependent on two things, the patient's position and their condition. So for today, we're gonna do just a little bit of a game day walkthrough. We're gonna talk about some of the stronger points. The, the entire premise of this first live cut is reading the wreck. What do I have in front of me? And that doesn't mean that we're going to jerk this patient out of the car as fast as humanly possible. It's trying to get those little bits and pieces, all those little tips and tricks from all around the country that come into play to make the extrication better for the patient. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So let's talk a little bit about some of the equipment that we use. Some departments have older cutters. Right? The older cutters, and this is no denigration of any older equipment whatsoever, that's just what some departments have. You want to make sure that the tools you have are up for the task of what you have in front of you. Sometimes it's faster to make a series of small cuts with a cutter that has remarkably less cutting force than some of the new cuts. If you follow the NFPA ratings by any stretch for the last X amount of years, they had an A, B, C, D, E rating. 
Nine was the highest rating that you could get. Genesis Rescue Systems was the first to achieve an all nine cutter. When they talk about the new material, the F material, Matt, come on in and take a, sh take a shot at this if you would. So this is the new F material, extremely strong, okay, in this rectangular shape. New material doesn't cut like older material. New material gets to a compressional force and it severs itself. These edges are razor sharp. So if you're cutting any of the new material, and you'll, you'll know that you're cutting new material when you're cutting on a newer car, sounds like pieces of plastic snapping as opposed to the normal crunch of the metal of the older cars that we had. But any edge that you have, if you have exposed skin or if the patient has exposed skin, you want to make sure you're keeping them away from this or covering it with a sharp protector. This will cut you long, deep, and continuous if you're not careful. Okay, Genesis is also the only one with an F7 cutter. It's the strongest cutter on the market. That's going to be on the streets here in probably at about four or five months. So let's talk about the vehicle itself. When you come up to an MVA scene, right, we should have one person coming off the truck who's going to do the 360 of the scene itself. The other should hopefully have just a little writing assignment tag on their seat. It's immaterial who you put in the seat, but this seat is responsible for whatever you want to divide that up to. Behind the drivers is going to take care of the spreader and one step chuck. Behind the officer is going to take care of the cutter and whatever. So it doesn't matter whose butt you put in there, you know that those operations are taken care of. What we're trying to do is decrease our on-scene time to our actual extrication time. And again, completely dependent on the patient's position and condition. If we need to really step it up a little bit, we want to hustle a little bit faster. So the first thing we want to look at when we're rolling up is what type of vehicle do I have? Is it an older car? Is it a newer car? And that doesn't mean that you need to know if this is a 2013 or a 2017. It means 62 Chevy Nova, mid-80s Buick, 2020 BMW. All of those vehicles have advantages and disadvantages for us as rescuers, and they're also good in some ways and bad in some ways. Newer vehicles, a lot stronger material, a lot safer because of airbags, okay? A lot harder to cut through. Older cars, less airbags, less supplemental restraint systems for us to have to worry about. Steel's a little bit thicker, but it really comes apart nicely, okay? So let's talk about some of the steps we're going to do. And with me today is Mike Philbin. Mike is a seven-year veteran at this point of the Athens, Ohio Fire Department. Mike's gonna be my guinea pig and I'm gonna make him do things because <laughs> I can. So when we're starting our 360, Mike's going to start to do his 360 around the vehicle. You want to make sure that you're looking absolutely everywhere. He's trying to identify any hazards that may come into play. Is there gasoline running out from underneath here? Do the doors open? If you can open a door on a vehicle, all the better. That gives us another egress point and things to look for. Safety bars. Anything that may be a problem for us or a benefit to us. Mike, you got anything? I'm just keeping an eye here. As I can look behind my A-post, um, I'm taking a look at where my uh, airbag's attached. So I know that I'm not going to have a cylinder in this post. It's going to be farther back as far as a canister to deploy my airbag that's already here. I'm also making contact with my patient as I go, um, letting them know what I'm doing. Just kind of looking at your car. We're going to uh, take a few minutes here and we're going to get them out of there. So if your job is the OIC, is to make sure that you know what you've got in front of you. One of the best things you can do as you're doing your 360 around the vehicle is to start talking to the driver. Hey buddy, what's your name? Jimmy. Jimmy, anything hurt on you? Yeah, my legs are broke. So when medical arrives, we can tell them, hey, this is Jimmy. Jimmy's A and O times three. We know he's breathing and he has a pulse and he thinks that his legs are broke. So that's just give them a step up. What you don't want to do is the OIC and trying to find out what you have is immediately hold C-spine on this patient. Because if you do, you are now married to that patient and someone else is going to have to complete your task. What we're trying to do is decrease our on-scene extrication time by giving everybody that one task and making everybody accountable for what they're doing. Go ahead, Mike. As I continue to work myself around, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna see what kind of stabilization I'm gonna need. So most likely I'm gonna be able to get a plastic step chalk under this, uh, under this A post here. I'm working around, I'm missing my tire so that I know I, I can't deflate my tire, I can't get air pressure out that way. As I work to the front of the vehicle, I'm gonna see if my hood's attached or not. I'm gonna to need to be able to secure my battery so we're able to move along um, and kill that. So I know that that's gonna be a priority is to kill that battery as soon as possible. So as Gary kind of talked, as we do this 360, it's not a speed evolution today. 
but what it is is I'm going to make sure that I, um, I, I pay close attention to all six sides of the vehicle, four sides around, top and bottom. So my eyes are on top right now. What I'm looking for at the top of the vehicle right now is I'm seeing what the construction is. Do I have a sunroof? If I have a sunroof, I know that that changes the, uh, the structural integrity of the roof. So it could change in evolution later on. As I continue to work to the passenger side, I see that I don't have much damage on this side. So I'm still taking that step back. Um, true 360, I'm gonna open this door. Door opens, okay, I'm gonna leave this door open. Once again, I'm continuing to look at where I'm gonna stabilize this vehicle. This door opens, airbags are deployed. I see that I may have other airbags that are not deployed. As I move in here, I can see that there's an airbag tag on the side of this, this seat right here. So I know that there's a chance that there's a live airbag in this seat. As I look here, I know that I'm having a dash airbag that is not deployed yet either. So I'm keeping my eyes peeled for that. Just gathering a bunch of information so I can relay it to my extrication crew. As I work back around this side of the vehicle, I'm gonna look at the back of the vehicle. Big, large access point if I need an access point. You know, door gate that opens up. I'm coming back around and now we have covered four sides. I've had my eyes on top of the vehicle and the very last thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to look under my vehicle. What do I have under there? Gary, at this point we have a, we have a second patient under the vehicle. We're going to maybe start air medical or something at this point. So what we're going to do is have Mike hand that baby off to air medical. This gives you an excellent opportunity to call in reinforcements if you need them. That old adage of 20 years ago about, hey, we're not gonna call in any reinforcements is positively stupid. I'm gonna tell you that right now as a personal experience. Get the help coming your way. It doesn't matter if 20 years ago, Jimmy pissed off Mikey's father at a fire scene. You want that help coming to you as much as possible. Okay, work with the departments around you. You know what your lead times are to get those people and equipment to you. If you don't need them, turn them around. But I would much rather have 10 people standing behind me saying, hey, Gary, what can I do for you? As to really needing those 10 people and not having them called in just because of my ego. So let's take a quick look at the opposite side of the car. Matt, you follow me? Come on in. Would you be so kind to get that out of my way, sir? So now let's take it the visual, okay? Some of the things that we wanna shoot for. When you have bucket seats with a center console that you cannot see through, chances are great that you have some type of transmission down tube, transmission tunnel support, whatever you may want to call it, and everybody has different terminology. Keep in mind that the terminology is just germane to us for right now. We're not trying to call it anything different. We're just giving you a heads up to what to look for. Tiny little indicators. If you have your flashlight in hand and you can see something like that little screw, or if you have a panel, don't be afraid to look inside and sometimes you'll see exactly where the transmission down tubes are. If you have a side panel that you can pop off, don't be afraid to take a second and pop that side panel off. And if you look inside here, you'll see what is essentially a dash pipe. Some are dash bars, it's basically a square tube that goes across, sorry. And some are dash pipes. This tells me that I have a terrifically strong point to push from and that's gonna carry through the entire dash. These are important to know where they're at because if you go to lift a dash off a patient and we haven't been able to access those, there's a chance that, the, that it's going to pivot up just at that point. They won't automatically separate themselves. Now, what I get all the time is, hey, man, how am I supposed to do that if there's a patient in there? And the simple fact of the matter is I can't tell you that. It depends on their condition and their position. You may have to come from this side, get your saws all out, and cut all the plastic crap out of your way so you can get to the actual steel itself. For whatever reason, a lot of firemen are loath to remove plastic. They'll make one cut, then they pull it aside, and it'll immediately flat back. If you're gonna take something out of a car, take it completely out of the car and get it gone completely. That's what we're shooting for. So, let's walk back around to the far side of the vehicle. This is a perfect time to also intervene that with this being a live training, um, feel free to ask your questions. Facebook Live, go ahead and hit us up with your questions and we'd love to, uh, love to answer your questions live here. Yeah, we may not answer them real well, but we're gonna give them a shot, you never know. <laughs> so, one of the things we wanna talk about is stabilization and where you put your stabilization. Putting your stabilization in correctly the first time makes all the difference in the world when it comes to a proper extrication. Sorry about that, told you I was gonna screw this up. What a lot of people do is they will just take a step chalk or a piece of wood and they will throw it under the car willy-nilly and to their minds they think, hey, you know what, I got it. So here's one thing you wanna shoot for. Come on over, Matt.
Depending on the vehicle that you find in front of you, the landmark you're shooting for, if this fender was intact, is the little point where the front fender and the door come together at the rocker panel. If you look at any vehicle out there, if you open the door and look straight down, you'll see that your hinge pillar is directly in line with that on every vehicle out there. You also want to make sure that you're putting the proper cribbing in for the vehicle that you have in front of you. Okay? For us for today, like Mike said, I have no tire to deflate, so this step chock is going to do. What you don't want to do is get a step chock that comes up to here because that's the improper piece of stabilization for this particular vehicle. Each one of these is dynamic and each one will change. What most people do is they grab the step chocks, they'll lift the car up three, four, five times to try to get it underneath there. Preferably, you want to get your stabilization in place so you really don't have to do it on lifting, moving, jerking of the vehicle itself because all of that transfers onto the patient. Patients are scared out of their mind. That becomes old hat to us. We'll just lift the car and shove it underneath there because that's the same crap they've been teaching in fire schools for 20 years. Think a little bit more about the patient. Fortunate enough to go to Germany every year and teach, and they're very patient-centered. The less you bother the patient, the better it is for their outcomes. Make sure you've got a rescuer inside that vehicle, and he's communicating the entire time as things go on. The more you communicate with, with the patient itself, the better their outcomes are going to be. If you explain what's going on, they'll be a whole lot happier. So here's our stabilization point. Now for today, I'm not going to do the rest of the vehicle. This is just for demonstration purposes. We can use our vehicle to our advantage. Okay, so we take a good look here, and again, this is just me. I'm real big on if you do it once, you never have to do it again. Mike, let's go ahead and grab the cutter if you would, please. Once the hood is open, if I know that I'm only going to work on the driver side for today, I'm going to take that, hit, take that hood and just cut it off. All I'm going to do is bend it down so now I have access to I can see. I know that this car took a severe hit on the driver's side, which means everything's going to be shifted in that direction. So if I want this steel to go in this direction, I'm going to have to push from that corner. Extrication is really all about a game of angles. If I get my equipment in at the right angle, the steel will go where I want it to go. That doesn't always happen, but for today we're going to give it a shot. So let's take a look at this car. I've got exposed hinges, right? I'm not big on taking the hinges first. I always think it's easier to take the nader pin first because that's the way the door naturally opens. Mike, would you be so kind? So pay particular attention to the angles. I'm gonna stop you right there for one second. So this is where some people absolutely go wrong. You can see how that window frame is impeding their operation. So if I can just bring my cutter. Now Mike has much better access to get down to where that nader pin is without getting impeded by the door itself. Thank you, sir. So let's take a look at our hinges. Matt, come on over. So the first thing a lot of people do, the second that door comes open, is they pull this door forward. Let me get this out of my way. Watch cord, Matt. But they pull this door forward as far as humanly possible. And then they do this 15 times. 
Now, is that enough to get your patient out? It very well may be, dependent on the patient's condition. So let's take a look in here. Matt, come on over and take a gander at that. Go around the back side, let's take a look. So if I can get my patient's feet out of there, one technique that you may be able to use is to use your spreader. It's not technically a no relief cut dash lift, but what we're trying to do is we're gonna get it down onto here, open the spreader up like it's going over your patient's leg. Go ahead, Mike. Open her up. So come into here. Get it under the steering column. Go ahead. Good. Good, stop right there. And hopefully that's gonna give us enough room literally just to slide your patient out. We may have to go a little bit further, take the entire door off, but that's the, the, the real quick down and dirty. Let's get this patient out of here and slide them out without hopefully getting their feet trapped. So, RJ, do we got any questions? We're good? So, terrific. Again, not a speed evolution. This is a first one of its kind. Hopefully we didn't bore you too much. This is just a quick walkthrough of what we can do to get somebody out of there very, very quickly. We will make these a little bit more in depth. Hopefully you'll send us a couple of comments. We'd like to have suggestions too. So here's what I'm gonna tell you. There's no battleships for us to cut for. Uh, we can't find a space shuttle that we're gonna extricate and we really can't do this in a water tank filled with snakes. So if you got something good you want us to see, please feel free to shoot us an email, shoot us a little comment. Uh, I think that's about it. Mike, you got anything? That's all I got. Appreciate Super. you tuning in today. Thank you guys very much for watching. We appreciate it. Stay safe. Don't forget. Educate, demonstrate, extricate. Have a good day. Thank you.